Well, welcome to this, our 71st show uh, on Palestine Deep Dive. Um, and auspiciously, we're joined by two guests. And tonight I'm talking to um, two members of the network of photographers, photographers for Palestine. Um, and those of you who may not have heard of NPP, uh, Network of Photographers for Palestine, this is a collective of photographers and activists uh, who are dedicated to keeping the story of Palestine alive through the medium of photography. We're delighted to have with us tonight uh, Najib and Ahmed. And um, of course, you know, I'm, I'm going to inter introduce both of our guests to you. But we're very, very keen as ever to hear from you. So if you've got questions, please do send them in. Let us know where you are, um, who you are, and... Um, I think we're going to have a, a gentle conversation and hopefully we'll be able to see some of our guests work um, because there is no more powerful medium uh, than uh, photojournalism and photographs and, um, and bringing these images of uh, Palestine, occupied Palestine, to a global audience uh, is a very, very important thing. And we're very happy to help publicize uh, the work of both of our guests and indeed of the uh, NPP. Now, Najib, Najib Joe Hakim lives and works in San Francisco. That's where he is today. He joins us there. Um, uh, he was born in Beirut in Lebanon uh, and left the Middle East uh, with his parents back in 1956. Najib, you look far too young to have left the Middle East. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> That's it's what it says on the script, so it must be true. Uh, <laughs> Najib settled in the Bay Area after that, and growing up as a Palestinian in the United States, he became aware of his Palestinian roots only later and has explored this heritage in his photography over the years. And it would be interesting talking to Najib about that. And, of course, he uh, is currently the chairperson of the Network of Photographers for Palestine. Uh, we're also joined by Ahmed, Ahmed Al-Baz, uh, who is joining us from Nablus. Uh, Nablus, of course, has been very much in the news in recent weeks. Uh, shocking reports from uh, inside that city. Uh, but we're delighted to have uh, you with us today, Ahmed. Um, Ahmed uh, is uh, also a Palestinian photographer. Uh, he's a member of the Active Stills Collective. Uh, and Ahmed's work has been exhibited widely in the NPP's exhibitions in Edinburgh, Glasgow, and London, as well as in Germany, Denmark, Tunisia. And since early 2021, Amma's been working on a photography project about the Palestinian depopulated villages. So we'd like to talk about that and uh, on which the main body of the Israeli uh, state was created in 1948. And I think it says here that out of 531 villages, um, you, Ahmed, have visited at least 250. And I think given what we know about how difficult it is for Palestinians to move around their own country, it'd be very interesting to, to hear from you as to how you've managed to do this. Now, of course, this year, as you all know, uh, it, it marks the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, which was the main year of the, of the ethnic cleansing of the region, Palestine. Uh, this cleansing, many believe, is continuing to this day and has been possibly stepped up under the new far-right government led by Netanyahu. Um, now, starting from May this year, Ahmad is seeking to release his project in different ways and through street exhibitions, through galleries, etc. So many of you watching have got any ideas where uh, for uh, Ahmed, where he can take his exhibitions and have any special ins and can assist in that regard, please do get in touch and we'll make sure that uh, Ahmed uh, gets to hear about it. Um, now, this project also includes uh, phot photographing inside the refugee camps, Palestinian refugee camps, the di diaspora refugee camps, and amongst, I think, um, Palestinians worldwide. Um, now, just uh, before we start, we're, we're here. Marion Larson says hello from Kos, Greece. Uh, it, we don't know your full name, it, but it's hello to you, Ingrida. I beg your pardon. Hello from Ingrida, and she is uh, calling in 
from Vilnius in Lithuania. And Cara is, uh, says evening from the west coast of Ireland. Well, look, thank you to, to, to all of you who are joining. Um, you please, of course, uh, send in your questions. We are going to try and visit some of the works of both of our guests during um, the show. Now, I'm not really familiar with them, so they may well prompt me and say, well, look, Mark, stop burbling on. We would like to have for, for our viewers to actually see <laughs> some of this work that we've been doing. But I just wanted to begin uh, with you, Najib, if I may, because um, I think a lot of people be be interested. You, you, I don't think you've been, you were just saying before we came on air that you hadn't been back to uh, the Middle East and to, to Palestine since uh, 1981, um, and you left in 1956. Um, but it took you some time to kind of discover more about your Palestinian roots. Well, how did you discover? Well, clearly your parents, what have you? But what what made you, as a as an American citizen, you know, well away from the Middle East, but want to find out more? And also, what made you get into photography? Okay. Uh... Well, we were growing up in New York. That's how we, where we went when we arrived. And uh, I knew that we were from Lebanon. I was born there. I had a lot of relatives there. We had Arabic food at home. And uh, I just always assumed that we were from Lebanon, living in New York. But um, at some point in late high school, early college years, I remember the story my father used to tell me about riding his bicycle in Jaffa. And... Uh, I, I decided to go check out where Jaffa was in Lebanon. And there is no Jaffa in Lebanon, but I found one in a place called Israel. And so I went to him and asked him, you know, what's the deal here? And so he told me that uh, we're actually from Palestine. You know, my, he was from Jaffa and my mother is from Haifa. So, uh, and that kind of shook things up a bit because this was in the 70s. And at the time, there was so much news about the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, in the media, you know, going things going on in the Middle East, in Europe, and, and stuff. So um, it, it changed my life, really, because it was like opening up a box, you know, the Pandora's box, and it took me over. And, I, did, I mean, it was Hall of Mirrors. I, I see the mention of Hall, Hall of Mirrors, your portfolio of pictures from... Uh, from your sort of growing up and your your childhood and what have you, I, I, I mean, uh, does that is that kind of detailing your discovery of your Palestinian heritage, um, or these historical pictures of of your family for when for when they were there before they left? Yeah, um, I remember this scene uh, from a old Stanley Kubrick movie, Black and White. Um, I don't remember what it was about. I think it was had to do with a boxer. And there was a scene in a warehouse with all these mannequins and he was trying to figure out what was going on. Who was the guy he was chasing? Who was a mannequin? Whatever. And, and I, it made me feel a little bit like that where I'm looking at reflections, but I don't know which is the real, the real me or the real whoever. And, uh, and everything looked a little distorted, looked a little angled. You know, it was a very confusing period at some point. Mm. But... Um, you know, you, I worked my way out of it. <laughs> yeah, got Joe Baz saying, uh, uh, hi, Palestine deep dive, and Fahad Abu Akko, hello from Atlanta, from Galilee, a child of Nakba. Ah, here we have some. Can you talk us through these? Yeah, these are uh, some relatives of my mom's uh, in in Beirut, actually, after we left in 48. Um, beautiful pictures, a nice life, you know, we were middle-class Christian Palestinians on both sides. And, uh, you know, we lived, a, we weren't just some primitive, uneducated, ignorant people. We were, and that's what I think these pictures show that we were very cosmopolitan and uh, cultured people who wanted to live happy, fulfilling lives. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, maybe we can return and see some more of those a bit later on. But I, I wonder if, just moving on, and I'll come to you in a minute, Ahmed, if that's all right. But if, but but um, Najib, I think people would be quite interested in this idea of this collective, this uh, uh, you know how you as Palestinian uh, photographers are organised and how you came to set up this organisation. Because you know having the you know strength in numbers 
and also I, I imagine reinforcing each other and helping each other progress uh, and is is a great thing. So tell us something about uh, your organization, the the NPP, as I keep on referring to it, but the Network of Photographers for Palestine. Yeah, we, we were founded about 13 years ago um, by uh, Phil Chetwin in uh, Scotland. And uh, I don't remember the name of the co-founder in Gaza. And uh, those guys just put together the organization. They started with an exhibition uh, of uh, Tom uh, Herdahl's uh, were uh, yes. he was yes. killed by an Israeli sniper many years ago, uh, I guess yes. in 2003. Um, our job, our our mm. goals are to get Palestinian photographers seen, their work seen throughout the world, uh, and to give them whatever kind of support we can that we are able to. We've hosted 17 exhibitions for them uh, materially, like in in halls, also on the internet. Uh, and we're continuing to do so. Um, we've had uh, 30 different photographers participate over the years. Wow. And, uh, and with COVID, actually, it gave us an opportunity to broaden our, our audience because we were putting things up on the internet that we hadn't done before. And this year, we are doing a, a commemoration for the Nakba, the 75th anniversary mm -hmm. of the Nakba and doing some activities each month. And uh, next month, I believe, we will be showing an exhibition of photographs from Palestine, uh, of the, showing the current state of uh, the Nakba. You know, what's, mm -hmm. what's going on there that uh, is continuing, you know, from 1948 and before, actually. Yeah. And you mentioned Tom Herndl there. Um, of course, many of our viewers will know all about Tom. And of course, uh, Tom's uh, mother, Joyce, uh, is a, I think a frequent. Um, she's often watching uh, our shows and uh, is a contributor to Palestine Deep Dives in, in, in Palestine Deep Dive in many ways. So um, I suppose the question is, you, you know, I think to Tom was not Palestinian, so you don't have to be a Palestinian to be a member of uh, of your organization, do you? No, not at all. Um, but most of the photographers involved are Palestinian or uh, activists for Palestine who visit there and take, mm -hmm. you know, their own imagery and do their own work. You know, we have a, a woman from Germany who does is very active in Germany, and uh, and and very deep ties to Palestinians. In fact, uh, the Israelis have now uh, prevent are preventing her from re-entering Palestine. Um, yes. So yeah, it's it's a, it's a we're making it a global operation. We're expanding still, but right now it's United States and Europe and Palestine. Yes. Yes, yeah, so this is. I think this is. Uh, this is Tom Herndl, is it not? Right, the picture Absolutely. of Tom. Yeah, I mean, actually, it, Stephen Brinkley says, in spirit, of course, we're all Palestinian. And uh, Joe Baz says, um, Ah, are some of these photographs of yours, both of you, are you? Are they? Are they going to be made into a book? <laughs> um, well, they actually are. Some of them, anyway. There's a, a book I've done called Born Among Mirrors. It's available on magcloud.com uh, and, and MPP, uh, through NPP, I collaborate with a couple other photographers, uh, one in Scotland and one in Germany, where they've done similar projects of interviewing and photographing local Palestinians. So we've combined some of our work into a publication and that's also uh, available on uh, magcloud.com. Um, yeah, and that's and called home away from home. I, I think people watching will just see that um, uh, we've just uh, put up the link there for you. Um, also, the Palestine Chronicle has done the same. Uh, Ahmed, you've been very patient, um, uh, and so thank you for, for your patience and forbearance. And I want to come to you, if I may, um, and actually ask you about your um, your your latest project because. Um, you know, you 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 are. This is the year of the knack, but you have visited about two hundred and fifty, I think, Palestinian villages or former villages that have been 
where Palestinians were driven out from. Um, and um, I suppose, I mean, a lot of people will be curious as to, because we just know from some of the guests that we've had on Palestine Deep Dive before, it's just virtually impossible for people, for instance, to go from Gaza to the West Bank or from uh, East Jerusalem to Gaza or to travel around. So can you tell us something about your the, your latest project? Um, yeah, also how we might be able to see it. We, and we may we may be able to see some of your work um, now, but can you also tell us how you've managed to travel around the country? So actually that has been a dream for me to travel around Palestine and see the places that we've been hearing about from our grandparents and we've been uh, learning about in schools. I come from a small town called Nablus. It's in the heart of the West Bank. And for those who don't know, like the West Bank is mainly um, a tiny enclave within the region of Palestine. And it was enclaved after the events of 48, uh, in addition to Gaza Strip, of course. And it was separated from the main body of the Palestine region simply because of uh, the success of the Israeli Zionist settler colonial project when they managed to push out refugees from the main body of Palestine. They pushed them out to areas in Lebanon, Syria, or Jordan. Some of those who managed to stay in the country, uh, like my family, they were pushed out into two territories. We know them today as the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And to move out from these two territories, uh, territories into the main body of what we know now uh, know as Israel, of course, it's not an easy matter. You need a military uh, movement permit issued by the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Uh, only if you're Palestinian, of course, because if you're Israeli, you're allowed to travel almost everywhere in the country except for some uh, uh, tiny enclaves where Palestinian refugees are based. So uh, I'm 30 year old right now, and I managed to get that permit for a long for a long term um, almost two years ago because of a certain freelance contract I got with an organization in Jerusalem, which allowed me to travel for the first time uh, in my country in my free time. So I remember I started uh, touring randomly around these uh, villages uh, two years ago, trying to just educate myself, uh, these, see these places, try to take some photographs, of course, because I'm a photographer. And I was not planning to um, create a project, to be honest. It, it's, you know, it came up uh, as a natural result after all of these tools. And of course, I have a personal connection as well and family connection. My, my grandmother was expelled from a small town called Bisan, which has zero Arab Palestinian residents today in favor of the Israeli settlers. My grandfather was uh, in Haifa at some point. He used to have a shop. Of course, he lost it. And as we may know, uh, all Palestinians in the exile have no, ra no right to return to their depopulated places. So here in the screen, we see some of these uh, sites. And what was interesting visually for me is to show also the settlement expansion that is happening in that place. So at some cases, you may see an abandoned village next to an Israeli settlement. Uh, in some other cases, you may see Israeli settlers living in uh, these uh, houses. You know, sometimes they have Arabic in the, uh, in the entrance. This, for example, the graveyard that we see in, on the screen right now, uh, the mother of my grandmother is buried there. And that site is inaccessible by uh, people because as you can see for those who read uh, Hebrew and Arabic, it says it's banned to enter, entering there on your own responsibility. So, yeah. Um, politically for me, that was also something important because I feel I'm taking ba back the discussion on the Palestinian-Israeli question to the roots. Um, especially that right now, everyone wants to talk about Palestine-Israel. They start from 67. Mm -hmm. They skip the colonial rules of this uh, place. They don't want to talk about colonialism. 
the maximum they can they can uh, maximum framework they can adopt is occupation, which means a normal state is occupying a territory outside of its borders, which is uh, West Bank and Gaza. And this is unhealthy if we want to dream about a better solution for everyone, uh, the colonized population and the settler uh, com uh, community. If we want to dream about a better future for everyone, a lot of decolonization work should happen in this place uh, all over the country. Um, yeah, for example, when we see that photo of Haifa, where the cars mm -hmm. are parked in front of these uh, houses, Haifa used to have something like 73,000 people. Out of that number, only 3,000, if not less, people managed to stay. So we're talking about a city that lost 98% of its population. When we talk about Tiafa, where Tel Aviv is located today, we're talking about 120,000 in 48. Only 3,000 people managed to stay. Where are these people? Of course, in refugee camps. Like I live today with my grandmother. Mother, she's born in 36, 1936. Her return is banned to her hometown, and uh, the same is applied on all refugees being based in refugee camps in the region. However, if you are coming from a certain religion, which is Judaism. And if your family uh, have converted to Judaism, let's say two, three hundred years ago, and you live far east, far west, far north in the world, you are allowed, you are eligible to come, get the only real citizenship of this country and live uh, on these sites of the depopulated villages and enjoy the full rights, which I'm not enjoying, like use the airport, which I'm not allowed to use drive everywhere in the country, which I can do, of course, as someone who managed to stay in Palestine. However, any refugee in these refugee camps of Lebanon, Syria, or the West Bank, if you want, and Gaza Strip, their uh, uh, return is being denied to this day. Where is the logic? We should ask the Israeli state. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, we're all very struck by many of these pictures, which show churches, mosques, villages uh, abandoned. Um, and also the fact that, you know, there there is a cemetery with a member of your family and it's very difficult to go and visit. Um, pe people will be struck that it's quite extraordinary all these years on that these places have just been left and you... You know, it takes a special, you have to have a special pass to go and visit where your family might have come from. It's very, very difficult, I think, for people to comprehend. But look, we've got a few people who sent in some uh, some messages. Um, I'll just read them out to you. Uh, Rick Tejada Flores says, um, both of your work is so important, and I hope it can be more widely available. Congratulations. Chiara says, uh, from Ireland, Palestinian children's art has been taken down from a hospital wall, and this was in London, you might re recall this story, after lobbying by a pro-Israel group. Um, have photographers experienced that sort of censorship or deplatforming by pro-Israel groups? We'll come back to you both on that one in a minute. Shivis Moore says, delighted to be with you. I lived in Palestine between 1997-2008, teaching at Birzeit University. I work now with Zawaya in the San Francisco Bay Area, and deeply admire Najib's photos. Um, Stephen Brackens Brinkley says, thank you. I just want to encourage all of my activist brothers and sisters to join me and support your Palestine Chronicle, the authentic voice of Palestine, and our brother, Dr. Ramsey Baru, to be part of this great work and support it. Go here. Uh, Larry Coyle says, saludos from San Francisco, California. So, um, yeah, just I mean, briefly, have you, have you, you know, have you faced uh, kind of, or have you both? I'll come to you first, Ahmed, and then to you, Najib. Have you both faced the kind of censorship that has seen people say, no, well, you mustn't exhibit these works, um, uh, as just recently happened to these ch this children's artwork in a hospital in London, which was removed? Ahmed, have you had that problem? So if you're referring to this project, I uh, it's not yet released. I just mm. published a quick uh, photo essay last year in the Nakba anniversary. 
And I cannot remember what what was the reaction to that specific piece, but usually we get something like, hey, you're an, uh, a person accused of uh, anti-Semitism or you hate Jews, or although the, it has nothing to do with that. Like I, I always say that using that as a tool to attack a battle against colonialism is very harmful to... Um, to the Jewish community itself, uh, when you're tr when you're trying to scare anyone who has nothing to do with the racism or uh, hate towards Jews, who's only uh, seeking to decolonize his own place, you know, and you use that tool in front of him, it's I, mm. I think it's uh, doing the opposite harm. So away from that usual um, comment that we get on our projects, I can't remember of uh, anything else. I mean, Najib, have you run into any issues when you've been exhibiting material that people say, oh, this is, out no, this is outrageous, it shouldn't be allowed? Well, um, in my case, I think most of the time it's pretty subtle. I just get a rejection for an application to, um, mm. and I never get coverage in the mainstream publications of the Bay Area or in the United States. It's usually Middle East oriented or Palestinian oriented kind of publicity. <laughs> But there was one case where I was exhibiting my Home Away From Home project, which is a series of portraits of the Bay Area Palestinian community and uh, live audio recordings of their stories um, in a local community. And the mayor of that community informed the Israeli consul that this exhibit, exhibit was being put up at that town's library. And of course, they, the Israeli consul uh, mo motivated the, um, mobilized the local Jewish community and got them to make a big protest. And it wasn't just my exhibition, it was also that community's attempts to establish a sister city relationship with Bethlehem. So mm. between my exhibition and the mm. relationship with Bethlehem, for some reason we were, uh, I don't know, in it was implied that we were anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, something along those lines. And why why the mayor of this town is contacting the Israeli council about a exhibition, a photo exhibition in the library. And the library got scared. I mean, <clears throat> they did have the exhibition. We did have an opening, but the library's uh, top representatives didn't show up. They did not participate in any way about with this project. Yeah, I mean that sounds sounds horribly familiar, time and time again. And uh, interestingly, also with some of the um, universities in the United States, any uh, any mention of Palestine or lectures on Palestine, uh, from my own experience, sends people scurrying in another direction. People seem to be really quite frightened, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we're probably we've all been familiar with some of that. Um, so I'm just wondering, I mean, actually, we've got another question here, if I might get this one in a couple. Um, yeah, Omar in London asks, and I, I, I know that you're both photographers, photojournalists, but his question is more about uh, documentary filmmaking. He says, what tips do you both have for young documentary filmmakers? What are the crucial aspects of making a powerful and informative film today? And, and hopefully one that is going to be seen by everybody. Do you want to say something about that, Ahmed, first? Uh, the answer may be long, but I will try to put it in a couple of sentences. I believe um, we should start by learning about the main techniques of uh, documentary filmmaking, and the different schools, the different types, and adopt the one that is serving our topic, our content. Um, another thing is the argument you're using if uh, if you, you're presenting in your work, as long as it's enriching, as long as it's unique, um, the project should be interesting at least to some people. Mm. Najib? Well, I'm not exactly a documentary filmmaker, but I know that you need to establish or put together a really talented and motivated team because filmmaking is not an individual sport. 
it's a team it's a team sport and without a good team uh it would be much harder to get anything done whether it's financial mm -hmm. or distribution or editing camera work sound it's a much more complicated uh process yeah um Ahmed, coming to you, uh, Mary, uh, who is in Southport in Northern England, she asks, um, what's it like working day to day in the field? Uh, have you faced difficulties with the occupation forces when you're going about your work? Um, and is tear gas a normal part of your working day? Uh, and what reaction do you have? Do you hope people have to your work? So three, three in one questions there. <laughs> Uh, I always say that I think the Israeli authorities is not ready to give any privilege to a Palestinian person. Uh, if he's a journalist or if he's a photographer, even with a press card, they, I don't think they see, they see that. And this is how uh, the famous journalist Shirin Abu Akhla was killed. I don't believe she was killed because she was Shirin, but because that unit which was in Jenin camp that day was not ready to give a privilege for a group of journalists sit, standing somewhere in the camp when they need to shoot they just shoot so yes whenever I cover these political protests or the um, incidents that happen here and there sometimes we face difficulties if the soldier is not in a good mood that day you know uh, they may tell you, hey, it's a closed military zone, you have to leave. Once they show you a piece of paper that declares that they can arrest everyone from that area, including journalists. I was detained for uh, something like half a day. Uh, I was interrogated. What my charge was being in a closed military zone, which was the site you of... You have a military pass. You have a military pass that enables you to... But the, so they still say you're in the, you have to leave. But tell me, do, I mean, you know, you know, I think you explained that you were treated rather differently if you perhaps work for, well, I mean, it didn't save Shireen, of course. She worked for, 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 for my old network, Al Jazeera. But, I mean, if you're working for Reuters or the BBC or something, then you might have a bit more protection from what you were saying. But what, what sort of, do you wear protective jackets and helmets? I mean, what does to show that you're a journalist in, in these situations? Uh, the answer is yes. I have a jacket, helmet, and tear gas. And whenever I'm going to a place where is there is uh, where is there an incident happening or a demonstration, I prefer to have them, just to make yourself visible at least. Um, and to be honest, sometimes you face a friendly uh, army unit who are feeling okay about journalists and they just keep you around and you do your work nicely, which is good. You know, if I want to produce a good picture, if I want to get close enough to the topic, I, I'll i be honest, I enjoy that luck on that day. But that's mm -hmm. not always the case. I mean, I, I've seen recently um, postings on social media of uh, Israeli politicians calling for uh, you know, iPhones to be banned from people from being prevented from uh, being at events and actually chronicling them in the way that uh, that you do. Um, do you do you? I mean, t tell us if you if you will whether, whether this is part of a plan by by the government. Are there plans afoot to to control access to actually stop people like you now, Ahmed, from from taking pictures? Um, uh, of, of situations where they just don't want you to see them. I, I think are things getting tougher, I suppose, is the question. Yeah. I have to be honest by saying I have interviewed about the thing you've mentioned. And I can say that yani, Israel is a smart uh, state. Yes, they are colon, uh, colonial power, but they are smart at the same time. To an extent, they don't follow every journalist or writer just because writing or publishing something online they are way smarter than this only when it gets to really uh secret information of or something i don't know touching uh a command or someone is about to be put to uh in prison you know of course they may but most of my mo most of my work is about daily stuff uh, so I have never been contacted, hey, why did you publish this? Mm -hmm. Why did you write that? 
So there is a space that you can work uh, within in this country. Yeah. And actually, we're just seeing pictures here now, which which you'll be familiar with, Ahmed, because you live there. This is the the daily travail of Palestinians um, going from one part of the territory to another, um, being forced to stand around. Something that I, I, I briefly saw myself um, when I was in um, Janina, when I went to Jerusalem, seeing people queuing in the in the in the hot, beating sun. Uh, and really, and you can see here, look, it's uh, this is like a prison. Uh, this is like a prison scene. These are very powerful images um, and images, by the way, that we often hear when legislators do actually come back, having had a visit to the to the Palestinian territories. Uh, this is uh, this is, has an enormous impact on them. But um, frequently, of course, this is this, well, but you all know this. You're taking photographs. But I suppose the question is uh, maybe a question for you, Najib. How many people who aren't Palestinian get to see pictures? How many Israelis get to see those kind of pictures? How many Israelis are actually aware of the ignominious situation of Palestinians who are simply trying to go to work? Well, clearly not enough. Um, I think, you know, pictures like this, information is powerful. And, you know, there are a lot of Israelis or a lot of people in the rest of the world. It wouldn't matter what kind of pictures you showed them, but for a lot of quote unquote normal people with some kind of conscience and sense of humanity, these would be very disturbing situation. <clears throat> um, we're seeing a picture uh, from my Home Away From Home project right now. Um, this is uh, someone, uh, Amin Saba, <clears throat> he came from Lida and he tells stories of his, um, expulsion from Lida, his his life growing up there first and then his expulsion and what his life was like uh, afterwards living in Libya and the United States later. The very touching stories uh, he talks about other people's experiences that he that he had witnessed as well. Um, <clears throat> you know I I'm really loving uh, I have made pictures of the abandoned villages. I shouldn't say abandoned. I should, they're probably depopulated villages because um, those are the places where a lot of the Palestinians in the diaspora or in the refugees camps, even in the West Bank and Gaza came from. Mm -hmm. uh, the pictures from my Home Away From Home project show some of the people who came from these villages at some point or their or their descendants. And so that kind of ties, um, I think, Ahmed's work and my work to, to some extent. Um, here's a picture of a young uh, college age uh, young man who's very eloquent in speaking about what it feels like to be a Palestinian in this country. And he talks about uh, his reaction to movies like Schindler's List uh, and how his reaction to it is so different from the average American's uh, perspective. You'll see these little QR codes in the uh, images. <clears throat> they are scannable, of course, so that you could, <clears throat> excuse me, actually hear the vo this, these people telling you their stories. So, you, you know, you scan it, you listen on your phone, and they're talking to you about some aspect of their lives as Palestinians in the United States or some experience they had when they were back in Palestine. Here is Lena, she grew up in LA and she went to the West Bank uh, many years ago and experienced a demonstration in one of the villages that was protesting the wall being constructed, separating the town, I believe it was separating the town in half or separating the town from the agricultural lands nearby that people worked and owned and how they were shot at and tear gassed and all the chaos involved. And her memory is that, you know, when you protest in LA, you protest, the protest is over, you go and you continue on with your regular lives. But when you protest in, in Palestine, you're taking your life uh, you're taking risks with your life, injury, mm -hmm. uh, even death, of course. 
Yeah, there's there's some. There's, I think uh, Laurie Coyle, who you must know, um, Najib, says, I, I remember the public comments book at your exhibit at San Francisco's main public library was stolen from the exhibit. But, uh, it contains supportive comments from people of all backgrounds and ethnicities. So I suppose it's when people, I, I mean, pictures don't lie. So when people can actually see, um, you know, before and after, just for instance, uh, you know, and leave comments that they've obviously been profoundly affected. I'm assuming that somebody took took the book either because they really wanted to keep it because it was full of wonderful comments, or they took it because <laughs> they just didn't want anybody else to write in it. I don't know. Perhaps you perhaps you've got some ideas about yeah. that. Oh, but look, I, I definitely do. Um, yeah. The book was tied by a cable to the table so that this wouldn't happen. And what this person did. They they disabled the counter at the at the door so that we would not have any information about how many visitor, visitors we had. But they also unplugged the television or video screen that was broadcasting a video of the project. So their intentions were pretty clear. <laughs> yeah, I see. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing was captured on surveillance. So they <laughs> saw the person doing it, but nothing happened. They didn't stop her. It was a woman. They didn't stop her. I don't know if anyone was actually watching the, the surveillance at the time or not. So, um, Ahmed, a uh, question here for you. Um, let's just shut up the uh, shut up the page. Uh, your your part. The question is, this is from Omar Sharma. Um, Omar asks, uh, is, you're part of Active Stills. Can you tell us more about this and also future activity? So uh, Active Stills is a collective of documentary photographers, which was established in 2005. It's not an organization or um, any uh, official body. It's just a group of photographer who, mm -hmm. photographers who use the same tool, which is photography, to serve the same question, which is the Palestinian question. And we all adopt, uh, we will all adopt the um, settler colonial framework for our photography work and we believe that by having such a body uh, different photographers can put their work there with no censorship with no control over the terminology the framework that we want to present to people away from the ones that the one that is usually adopted by um the big names such as reuters or afp and the whole discourse of occupation of 67 so that this is why this body was established and of course it is developing uh, by time um it's important to mention that it has palestinian international and anti-zionist anti-colonial israelis who are all united uh, under the same um, uh, any political question political struggle um a follow-up question, and this is uh, for you, Ahmed. This is from Jamal in, in Leicester in England. And Jamal asks, can you, Ahmed, tell us about what your views are on the mainstream media in the West? Do you feel that the mainstream media represents the realities of the ground in Palestine accurately? Yeah. So I don't follow international mainstream media that much because I live here, but uh, I can I can answer that question. Of course, they perceive the Palestinian question as a matter of terrorism. And usually Palestinians are framed as terrorists, such as every single country in the global south when it comes to a certain tension with the global north. You can see that example in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, everywhere you want so they don't go beyond that binary of uh, terrorism and countering terrorism they don't tell you what is the problem why these terrorists are fighting uh, what is their main problem in life you know you never get that answer and i think it is talking to the western audience you know because uh, people in the west had certain experiences uh, in the past, and they know how to perceive this kind of this type of news, and they never go beyond that until they see, for example, a photograph here or there, something a bit deeper than that. 
that starts raising the question for them. And from, the, from there, they may go to somewhere by le- learning more about what's really happening. Well, I mean, Ahmed and, you know, and Najib, I mean, what we, what we certainly have seen over the, in recent years is, the, is not only work by people such as yourselves on social media, but we've seen a lot of uh, independent media reporting, lots of different, we can have access to all manner of media from around the world that takes a different view to often what Western media is saying. Um, and, and, and therefore, you know, you, it is clearly having an enormous effect. It is, for instance, very interesting that when people talk about resistance to occupation in eastern Ukraine, um, people talk about people being freedom fighters, but if there's resistance to occupation in Palestine, well, there's terrorism. The people do seem to be able to see through more and more of this, and it means that um, your work is encouraging people to demand, uh, at the very least, a consistency, uh, a consistency, especially from uh, the Western from Western media. Now, look, uh, Bill Chetwind, who, of course, is very well known to both of you as the secretary uh, of NPP, um, has been in touch. Um, Obviously, uh, it's great to have you, Phil. And um, uh, I think also you were talking about uh, the uh, if if, if we'd like any of your exhibitions. I don't know quite what you mean by that. But what I think what you mean is that if people want to get in touch saying we would like to host um, exhibitions, by the MPP, please do. So please do get in touch uh, with us if you want to know more about the organisation and you want to, to mount some exhibitions wherever you are in the world. And we can get that information to both our guests here and also to Phil, who is the secretary. Ah, now. Can I uh, comment on something, Mark? Uh, yes, sure. Our previous conversation. This is why it's so important that people like Ahmed and myself are making doing the work that we're doing we need to have people speaking for their own you know people speak for their own stories we don't need the mediation of europe or the or the north or however you want to put it to tell the stories of you know the rest of the world for us because that's never going to be a fair Mm. um, presentation And just the discussion that we're having on Palestine Deep Dive right now is not a discussion that we would have if we were on CNN or MSNBC or on the BBC. This is not going to happen, at least not at this point in history. So your point about the Internet is we're, we're doing it at this very moment. You know, we're going beyond the heads of these big organizations. I mean, as a kind of somebody who came into journalism through newspapers, and I was in newspapers for a very, very long time, it always struck me that the most um, independent and effective ways of getting messages over and to get away from the groupthink, very much of uh, the groupthink of uh, the editorial staff, for instance, of newspapers, whether it be on the right, centre or left, uh, were either through cartoonists, uh, because no editor had ever dared censor a cartoonist, um, or if they did, there'd be a huge rout. But also through people such as as you, both of you, your photographers tell the story. Of course, I suppose then the editor's going to decide whether they're going to use your photograph to go with a particular story, whether they're going to cover the story in order to use the photograph. But the question for both of you, I think, is what power do you think you have? Let's say uh, you get called by a picture desk on one of the main- mainstream media organisations. What power do you both have to try to influence the captioning of that of that work? Because that's really important. Um, Ahmed, thoughts from you on that? So let's say I get assigned by an um, international media outlet, which is categorized as mainstream. I think I will be controlled even in the terminology I'm using. And these guys try to pre- to find a pretext for that by saying, hey, we're balanced, we're professional, you can't say that, you should say th- this. But, you know, it's not really the truth. So I'm, I'm going to give an, a practical example. So it's, uh, it's not allowed to call Haifa, for example, as an occupied city. 
an editor of PVC will come and tell you, hey, this is an, there has been international agreements. Haifa is not anymore occupied. You can't call it like this, but maybe Hebron, if you want, which is in the West Bank. And that guy will think that international law and the international agreements are the holy book that you cannot violate. But for me, it's, you know, it is also a bias to use that uh, framework because, because it's not error. It was created by someone. It was created to, to serve something. And we should be also critical in that aspect. So I'm really questioning the matter of uh, professionalism and balance and all of these terminologies, because I think there is one party in the world, which is coming from the West, is trying to put his their criteria as the main reference for the whole world. And yeah, you have no space to tell your story in the way you want to tell it as someone living in the South, simply because you're controlled by these definitions. Then you have an alternative option, which is going and publishing your piece in an alternative media outlet, such as the one that you, you've been showing on your screen. It's called Plus 972 here in Palestine. Uh, it's an Israeli-Palestinian media outlet. And there you can say colonialism, you can say occupied Haifa. But the reach, of course, is not that big because it's an alternative one. Yes, yes. Although we are seeing an enormous growth in independent uh, media. And um, I mean, you could argue that there are certain you know, networks that have become very prominent. I mean, for instance, Al Jazeera, good and bad, has had enormous influence, both that obviously the Arabic channel, but more, more recent years, the English language channel, um, in, in, re in reporting things from a, from a different perspective. I mean, Al Jazeera would always say that they reported both from where the missiles were fired and also from where they landed. So, um, yeah, I suppose there must be some hope that, um, uh, you know, that the, 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 pr the pressure that comes from the work that you have published in independent media, for instance, does feed in. Um, and you wonder, for instance, uh, we've seen the adoption of uh, an apartheid, um, Israel practicing apartheid policies, Israel as a, an apartheid state by the United Nations, by Amnesty International, by Betzalem, by others. Um, and, you know, it's much more common, this kind of language is much more commonly used. And there seems to be a much greater understanding of what's really happening and, and a desire also for people. We go back to this argument around consistency. You can't say, for instance, as the United States does, that uh, you, are, you are quite happy for Morocco to be occupying Western Sahara. That's what Trump said. They haven't reversed the policy. Uh, you can criticize uh, Russia for invading Ukraine and occupying parts of Ukraine. But you continue to arm Israel in its occupation. I think people are, ask, are asking these questions now in a, in a way that they haven't for a for a long time, but that's just my view. Look, now that you're in Manchester, we are, we are sadly running out of time, but um, we'll get see, get some more questions in if we can. Nadia in Manchester says, the Israeli state has often looted not only Palestinian homes and land, but also their creations, such as photographs of pre-1948 Palestine. For example, and both of you probably know about this, and I didn't, but here we are. For example, following... The 1982 invasion of Lebanon, Israel confiscated much of the work from PLO offices and took it back to Israel, where it has remained locked up and inaccessible to Palestinians. How should we understand this? What is what is it that Israel is afraid of exactly? Najib, I'll come to you first. Well, a lot of this is documentary evidence of the uh, the existence of Palestine. You know, they... The, one of the main narratives of Zionism is that it's a Palestine just isn't doesn't exist. It's a land for a people, uh, well, whatever the expression is, everybody knows. Um, this, there's, there's, they didn't just do it in Beirut or in Lebanon. They, they've done it within Palestine itself. There's a film out recently called The Great Book Robbery about how the Israelis. A military or uh, stole whole libraries from from Palestinian homes during the uh, 1948 uh, war, and uh, 
and to this day, those uh, those collections are still locked away, um, inaccessible to the owners and to the mm. public. Mm. Interesting. Well, Laurie Coyle says there's a documentary. It's called A Real War, R-W-E-L, of course, A Real War, about this theft. Israeli filmmaker Karnit Mandel has works as a picture researcher and consultant for celebrated Israeli documentaries. Um, while digging in an Israeli archive, she stumbles across film reels from a precious, long-lost Palestinian liberation organization archive seized by Israel in the 1982 Lebanon War. I'll tell you one, just one other thing that strikes, strikes me um, is, the, is, is, is how history uh, can be abused by whoever the, the victors are uh, and how documentary evidence can be used to, to create a false narrative. And I wanted to come to you on this, Alec. I was struck, I just read this not so long ago. Um, you, yeah, you recall General Allenby and, and the British forces uh, sort of defeated the Ottoman Empire and, and got to Jerusalem. I think there was about 10 odd years ago, there was a, a celebration organized by the Israeli state where they invited General Allenby's um, descendants to come along to this great event in Jerusalem, where it was presented as the victory over um, Muslim forces, a victory over Islam, um, when really it was no, no such thing. It was the defeat of the Ottoman Empire. And yet they were able to use those historical pictures to create this narrative. Are you sometimes a bit worried that, you know, the pictures that you take could be abused in a way they could say look these lovely empty villages uh in the palestinians is they're, they're just historical villages they've been empty for general you know we can go and look at them and we look after the churches and the mosques or whatever do you feel that your your work could be abused in that kind of in, a, in, a, in that kind of way uh it's an interesting question and the answer is that yes of course there's a chance for that to happen and that's why I never cooperate with a media outlet that I can't trust. And that's why we in Actus as the collective, we never have subscribers that we don't trust because we don't want anyone to use our pictures and caption them in a certain way. Because, uh, I don't know, a photo of a stone thrower could be captioned as a freedom fighter, but could be taken by another outlet and captioned as a terrorist throwing stones. So... I'm very careful about my cooperation. Uh, we in Arctics are also uh, very careful about our cooperation. And we want to make sure that our photographs is being ser uh, is serving the main goal for which it was they were created. Um, of course, anyone who want to use that and post it on social media and reframe it in another way, of course, they can do that. And this is happening, by the way. Um, every single thing that you may share as a Palestinian, the Israeli may take it and also share it, but he will uh, frame it in an opposite way. So it is happening also away from the world of photography, but also to what's happening on the ground. Um, but yeah, I agree with your introduction, and we always know that the winning party is the one that is writing history and writing present in enforcing present and we as photographers try to do simple things in order i don't know to respond to such a reality mm -hmm. um we are going to have to finish fairly shortly but uh, phil chetwind here says do we have time to mention the pathetic role of the palestinian authority which recently imprisoned imprisoned one of our photographers recently well yes we do um, I don't know if either of you can throw any light on that very briefly. Uh, I cannot. Uh, I don't know any of the details, and I don't know the work of the photographer, but Ahmed probably knows him. So, Yeah, I may take this chance to criticize the Palestinian Authority. Yeah, for many people around the world, they look at the Palestinian-Israeli question again in a binary way, like Palestinians and Israelis, and they forget that there are so much divisions with, within the Palestinian front. So here in the area of Palestine, we have a body that was created maybe 20, 25 years ago. It's called the PA, the Palestinian mm -hmm. Authority. 
And um, I feel that the majority of Palestinians see them as an agent for the Israeli colonial authorities. So this is merely their existence. They were created and they are operating for that uh, goal. So, yeah, to explain that recent incident, a photographer uh, went from Nablus, went to cover a funeral <clears throat> of a Palestinian fighter who was killed by Israelis uh, last month, late February. And imagine what happened. Uh, the funeral was attacked by the Palestinian Authority. A Palestinian funeral was attacked by the so-called Palestinian Authority, and they couldn't Beer, a young photographer taking a photo of that. So he was taken uh, for detention for something like three days. And they asked him questions like, hey, who sent you? What is your goal of taking such pictures? And he was released when they found he's just a young media student trying to practice his political photography on the ground. So, so I mean, yeah, yeah, people yeah. watching this can see that, you know, photographers such as yourself and others face problems from all all sides all aspects in a way but um uh, but you know you but you carry on this vital work um and so we just as we draw to a conclusion just to say um you know phil chetwin has very kindly been in touch and said look you know if you if, if people out there would would like to know more about exhibitions they can be arranged so do get in touch with palestine deep dive or indeed with phil chetwind um, please, of course, uh, follow Ahmed Albas on Twitter and elsewhere. And um, look, I, I should just like to thank both of you very, very much. More power to your cameras, um, more power to all that you do uh, in, in, in bringing the reality of life for Palestinians uh, to us all around the world. And thank you also to everybody who's joined us from all around the world as well, from uh, North America, from Europe, from the Middle East. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated. This has been a fantastic discussion. So um, very grateful. We'd love to have you on again. And I'm sure many people who've been watching would like to see a lot more of your work. So thank you. And until next time, it's goodbye.